So hello everyone and welcome to the first Making Public History Seminar for 2023. I'm Margaret Anderson from the Old Treasury Building and I'm your host for this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I thank them for their care of country and of culture and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that respect to any other elders who may be present tonight. Making Public Histories is a seminar series offered jointly by the Monash University History Program, the History Council of Victoria and the Old Treasury Building. And it's now been running for 15 years. Each event aims to explore issues and approaches in making public histories. The seminars are open to anyone interested in the creation and impact of history in contemporary society. And I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us this evening. This particular seminar is also offered as a contribution to the Women's History Month program in Victoria. Now, just a brief introduction the share. Apologies, folks. Not moving along, so I'll tell you. A brief introduction to the format for the evening. This is a webinar format, so unlike a normal Zoom meeting, only the presenters and hosts will be seen and heard. Each speaker will speak for 12 to 15 minutes, and then there will be five minutes for Q&A. The Q&A sessions will be hosted by my colleague, Alicia Cerrito of the History Council of Victoria. And at the conclusion of the evening, there will be about 20 minutes of a Q&A for the entire panel. If you have questions for the presenters, and we do hope you will, will you please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen? If you have any technical issues though, or if you just want to thank the speakers, please use the chat button also at the bottom and we'll do our very best to help you. Of course, please keep any questions you have polite and respectful. If for any reason our presenter's internet connection is slow or disruption or disrupted, they might continue with voice only. So don't worry if that happens. And finally, as you heard at the beginning, we're recording this webinar tonight and the recording will be available in a few days time. Now we have a terrific opening seminar this evening, which is also highly topical. In October last year, the newly elected federal Labor government made a commitment to ending what it described as the national disgrace of violence against women and children within the next decade. This seminar will report on current research projects designed to place that issue in historical context. We've titled the seminar, as you can see, A National Disgrace, The Long History of Violence Against Women in Australia. And we have three wonderful speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Zora Simic, who's working alongside Anne Kerthoys and Catherine Kevin in an ARC project to historicise domestic violence in Australia. Zora is a senior lecturer in history and gender studies in the School of Humanities at the University of New South Wales, and she's published recently on this topic, along with many others. Her paper this evening is titled A Public-Private Problem, Historicising Domestic Violence in Australia. Welcome, Zora. Thank you, Margaret. I'll stop sharing and yep. allow you to. <laughs> and I will share my screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, oops, sorry. Um, let me just try to play from the start. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming. It's exciting to see so many people have registered for this evening. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking today from unceded Gadigal land in, in Sydney and to pay my respects to elders past and present and to any First Nations people who may be listening today. Um, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me. Um, I'd also like to say 
is part of my preface that I'm just recovering from COVID. So if I'm a little bit flatter than usual, um, that, that explains it a little bit foggy. Um, I'm, I'm very happy though, to be, I really wanted to be part of this panel, particularly because I'm also a huge admirer of Alana and Lisa's work as well, and the work that they do with their various collaborators. And I consider us part of a wider resurgence of interest in gendered violence in Australian history. And I'd, I'd say also, uh, it also is part of a larger interest in violence in Australian history that we have seen uh, in the last decade or so. So gendered violence, as we all know, um, also sadly endures into the present. And I recognise that this is a sensitive topic which affects the lives of many of us directly and indirectly. So the latest and fourth personal safety survey conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics found that one in four women and one in 14 men have experienced intimate partner violence. One of a number of arresting findings which warrant the description national crisis or national disgrace. So Margaret just mentioned the, the, the Labor government's use of the term national disgrace. And another recent one is by uh, Malcolm Turnbull in 2016. Um, but, you know, these are hardly the first times that, that domestic violence has been expressed in these terms. Um, it's my hope that historical understanding can contribute to, to eradicating what has been described and uh, reducing or eradicating what has been described as an intractable social problem, insofar as more knowledge and resources have not budged the statistics very much since they began to be gathered from a variety of sources and using a variety of methods from the mid 1980s. So my paper title, A Public Private Problem, um, refers to what I mean by that is that while domestic violence is more visible as a public concern than it, it, than it has ever been, the notion that it is a private matter endures. And we can see that in this poster from the Feminist Art Collective, which work posters in the 1970s. So it illustrates on the one hand, there's this new terminology of at that time, domestic violence, to, to, to discuss the issue, um, while also on the other, recognition of pervasive silence. And that is one tension that we've seen throughout, throughout our history. It's both visible, but you must assume silence at the same time. So we now have more people sharing their lived experience than ever before, but we cannot underestimate the enduring difficulty in doing so including for Indigenous women, many of whom have remarked that when they speak, they are not often heard. So at present, the Personal Safety Survey does not collect specific data on First Nations people. Um, and that's one reason that they've called for their own dedicated national plan, nor on um, a variety of other groups, including those with diverse sexual and gender identities, although you know other, other forms of research, of course, exist um, on these phenomena. Um, and, you know, for those interested, you know, a great repository for this sort of information and analysis is ANROS, the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, which was a product of the first national plan uh, into domestic violence. So just this week, some of you may have known the ever top topicality of this topic, as, as Margaret uh, pointed out. Just this week, ANROS released the findings of their 2021 National Community Attitudes Towards Violence Against Women survey. And while the overall picture is one of gradual incremental improvement between 2013, when the results of the first survey were revealed, and 2021, there are numerous contradictions and concerns to note, including that while 91% of the 19,000 plus people surveyed agreed violence against women is a problem in Australia, only 47% agreed that it is a problem in their own suburb or town. So this idea that domestic violence or violence against women occurs somewhere else in particular communities is, is also a pattern that we have observed historically. 41% believe domestic violence is perpetrated equally by men and women, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. So dig deeper and there are more details. 37% of respondents thought that those in custody battles often make up or exaggerate claims of domestic violence to improve their case and that many women exaggerate the extent of women's men's violence against women. 23% um, have, have that, hold that view in the survey. And nearly a quarter of respondents thought a lot of what is called domestic violence is really just a normal reaction to day-to-day -day stress and frustration. So the summary report concludes that there is room for, to improve understanding of the gendered nature of domestic violence as, as a phenomenon that is mainly perpetrated by men against women, as well as how intersectional inequalities exacerbate risk of violence for marginalised groups. 
Further, while the majority of those surveyed recognise DV can manifest as a range of physical and non-physical behaviours, there is less recognition of non-physical forms such as coercive control. The report also notes that attitudes towards DV have plateaued in the 2000 to 21 period, despite a high level of public discussion of this issue, um, and which you, I'm so sure all of you would be aware of, but here is just some examples of the increased visibility of what some have described as the Batty effect, of course, referring to the former Australian of the Year and domestic violence survivor, Rosie Batty. And these are some, some examples of the increased visibility around domestic family and gendered violence, some of which have explicitly positioned themselves as addressing an urgent problem or crisis. The memoirs by Haida, who was Muslim and of Lebanese background, Yorta Yorta woman, Diana, Diana O'Brien, who is part of the Stolen Generations, and Akuk Kual Anyeth, who came to Australia as a young girl and refugee from South Sudan, meanwhile, complicate the framing of domestic violence as a national crisis by positioning it in relation to other forms of violence, including settler colonialism, the carceral state, war, displacement and racism. And I think thinking about domestic violence, both within a national frame and in this broader sense, is really important. Each of them reference and appreciate the increased visibility around gender-based violence, including domestic violence, but also alert the reader to its uneven effects, including that violence against Aboriginal women, Muslim women and migrant refugee women are either comparative, is either comparatively in, invisible, not taken as seriously and or caricatured as inherent to their cultures rather than widespread and cultural. So what can historians and a long view offer this present moment of unprecedented visibility of public discussion of domestic and family violence on the one hand and persistent patterns of concerning attitudes, assumptions and incidents of DV on the other? So the project I'm speaking to today might also be considered part of this tipping point. Though circa 2005 was hardly the first time that domestic violence has been framed as a national problem or crisis, particularly since the mid 1970s, when domestic violence began to emerge in public discourse, eventually surpassing, but never entirely supplanting earlier and more explicitly gendered terms such as wife beating, wife battering and wife bashing. Okay, so this is the project of which I'm referring and here are some of our some of the places that our publications have appeared, including in an edited collection edited by Alana, who is part of the panel tonight, that's Gender Violence in Australia. So in 2020, Anne Kirthos, Catherine Kevin and myself were awarded a government funded grant to produce a history of domestic violence in Australia from 1850 to the present. Cognizant of how violence, including gender based violence was foundational to settler colonialism. The history properly commences in the mid 19th century um, when it became more visible with the introduction of colonial divorce laws, which allowed for separation or divorce on the grounds of cruelty. Originally, it was intended to conclude with the murder of Hannah Clark and her three children by her estranged husband in February 2020, a tragedy which intensified public attention and which has ceded coercive control legislation in Queensland. However, given the increased global incidence of DV from the onset of the COVID pandemic, we would be remiss not to include it. This history also suggests that between now and when we finish writing the book and publish it, there will be no doubt other awful tragedies which rouse public interest and outrage as many more, as well as many more which go unremarked. So our history is focused on the most common form of domestic violence and that which is most observable historically. Men's against women in intimate relationships, but with recognition of other forms and in the hopes that our project helps seed future histories, for instance, a dedicated history of domestic violence in children, in same sex relationships and or in specific communities. It will be the first overarching history of domestic violence in Australia, though we are hardly the first historians to address it uh, as a direct focus. Kay Saunders and Judith Allen deserve special mention here, or as part of histories of other phenomena in which DV appears, from histories of war through to histories of the family. Um, indeed, Alistair was just mentioning prior to this, week, this talk that it is appearing in histories of the family, in oral histories of the family quite prominently. So we've divided our history into three time periods. Oops. Yes. Oh, I've lost Anne's screen. Oh, there it is. Um, okay, sorry. Oops. What happens when I do a oops, I've lost, sorry. I must have deleted it. <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, Anne's is 1850 to 1918 um, in the colonial press from the mid-19th century on. Wife beating was the most common term used to describe violence against women by their partners 
followed at some distance by wife abuse, and it was deployed in both sensationalist and serious fashion, including as a way to assess the development of the colonies in relation to Britain. There was some limited recognition that wife beating occurred across all different social groups, but most commonly it was associated with working class men and alcohol abuse. And I originally had an image up of the Lone Hand, the companion publication to the Bulletin, the repository of many representations of wife beating as a common feature of married life. Um, and in that screen that I <laughs> accidentally deleted, um, the, the most common sources we're using in that period are court records, um, newspapers, and to a lesser extent, um, public, public, uh, popular culture, uh, private correspondence, diaries, and so on. The middle period is 1918 to 1970, 1970, and that's Caff's period. And it's a period in which wife beating and marital cruelty endured as terms through which violence in the home was understood though we also see wife bashing becoming the more common vernacular term. So note in this newspaper story here, it's a judge responding to the suggestion that court cases involving domestic violence, although that was not the term used at the time, should not be public. And this is indicative of a period in which DV was often represented as an individual pathology. And while we have assumed that only the physically violent cases are on, are on the historical record for this period, the full range of domestic abuses is visible in novels and in specific legal records, such as cases of constructive desertion. So some groups, however, for instance, Southern European migrants in the post-war period are also represented as more inherently prone to, to marital violence than others. And in a moment, I'm going, I've asked Kath and um, Anne, neither of who could be here today, to provide me with examples of the research, because we were right deeply in the, in the middle of this, um, so at, at this point. My period, meanwhile, is 1970 to the present, and I, I describe this as a bottomless archive. I will never, ever get on top of it in the period um, that we've assigned ourselves to work on this project. Um, and the, we, we see that the vocabulary, it, it, you know, it gets, it, these are just the more common terms under which domestic violence um, um, is, is understood. And note that a lot of these, it's not like the case that one supplants the other, that they coexist at the same time. Um, and in fact, domestic violence doesn't really enter common currency until the late 70s. This here is the, the conference proceedings of the first national conference on domestic violence in 1985. And you can see there a note on terminology, which notes uh, woman and wife battering, assault, domestic violence are terms that are used interchangeably uh, at this conference. And you also see at this time, from the outset of this use of the term domestic violence, there were there were reservations about it, um, also recognitions of its strength, that it was a good way to appeal to governments to get funding and so on, and to increase our understanding of what domestic violence entails, uh, not just physical violence, for instance, but some, including feminists, were concerned that it took away the focus of um, not only the gender dimensions, um, of some of the gender dimensions of domestic violence. Okay, so the sources here are as with the, with the previous records, court records, divorce cases. Also, in addition to those divorce cases, we have the family court from 1975, and that is the archive that I'm currently working on. A lot of that is digitized. And an interesting thing about the family court is, um, and as historians like you know, Shirley Swain have recognized, is that from its inception with, of no fault divorce, they did not quite anticipate um, how much domestic violence would appear in those cases that made it before the family court. That with, with there not being a provision for marital, marital cruelty, that ends up becoming one of the core business of the, of the family court. Um, we see the emergence of the DV sector. We see government responses, criminal responses. We see AVOs. We see you know, a plethora of media treatments. Um, documentaries, TV series, investigations, a feminist and other forms of activism. It's, it's important to say, I mean, um, I come from a history of the history of feminism, and that's where I kind of began this period, but that is only a part of the story of activism around, around domestic violence. Um, and we see much more evidence of first-hand experience. Okay, so now I'm aware that I'm running out of time. I, I've asked, I asked Anne and Kath to provide examples from their period um, and to make larger points about, about them. 
So with Anne's period and all of the period that we're looking at, the whole period of the history of domestic violence in Australia, it's, it goes without saying that domestic violence must be understood in relation to other forms of violence and gender and race relations more generally. And one case study that, that Anne has recently uncovered um, and this is drawing on divorce court records, Supreme Court records for an inheritance case um, and, and uh, detailed reports in newspapers, is that of Louisa Vincent, who in 1867 sought a legal separation from her husband on the grounds of cruelty. She described a litany of behaviours familiar to modern scholars and activists concerned with domestic violence. He rep her husband repeatedly struck and threatened her using very disgusting language in her words, would turn her out of bed at night and make her walk up and down the room for hours, forced her to eat in the kitchen rather than the dining room, and finally, in a drunken rage, threw her out of the house and removed her from his will. So Louisa's story is a common one, not just in this period, but in, in all of them, in its, in its range of behaviours that we would understand as constituting domestic violence. Except that her, her husband, Henry Vincent, was a superintendent for 22 years of an island prison for Aboriginal men and is now remembered by the Indigenous people in Western Australia as an especially cruel and violent man. The prison was established on Rottnest Island by British colonial authorities as a weapon in their attempt to crush Noongar and other Aboriginal resistance to British settlement. As the wife of a colonial jailer and abusive husband, Louisa Vincent's petition for separation reveals the techniques of colonial violence but also the intersections between public and private violence, evident in both the past and still today. So the records, um, and, and this, this idea of, of, of understanding uh, domestic violence in relation to violence is something that, um, in, in violence more generally, is something that I'm coming across now. I'm currently researching the 1990s, which I'm interpreting as a period of backlash to advances in responding to uh, domestic violence um, is that there was a national conference on violence as a general pattern uh, in Australian society at this time uh, and where domestic violence sat in relation to violence more generally was a question that keeps recurring in that context. Is it a special form of violence and what ways can it be linked to wider patterns of, of, of violence? Okay. Cass' example that she wanted to share with everyone today is an interesting one in terms of thinking about how domestic violence has been policed. And this, of course, is another contemporary debate about domestic violence. Um, we see plenty of contemporary evidence about advances in, in policing around domestic violence, um, you know, innovative programs and so on. But we also see some disturbing phenomena, such as studies that show, for instance, in Queensland, that there is a high rate of um, that, that, that policemen are overrepresented in statistics around domestic violence perpetrators, these kinds of things. Um, one uh, rich resource that Kath has found in her period is in looking at the women's police in South Australia, which is where she's based. So she's researching the Adelaide Women's Police Journals from the 1920s onwards, which describe their activities every day and has observed a significant shift. In the 1950s, um, there were many references to marital abuse. About every second or third page of, the, of the, the notes that they kept refers to this as the, as the core business of their work. Whereas when the women's police were established from the 1920s, it was much less likely to refer to marital abuse and was much more focused on policing sexual and social morality among young people, which was in keeping with the ideas that informed the establishment of the force in 1915. But note that the women's police in South Australia and elsewhere, including in Victoria, where many of you are, were akin, were more akin to welfare officers. So this is history is part of a wider history of policing of DV, but also distinct from it. And where I'll end today is, is sort of returning to where I began with, you know, the release of the Anne Rose survey uh, uh, in the last week into attitudes of domestic violence. So one of the first um, and part of what I've been doing is, you know, with this huge archive of information is getting the public story of domestic violence. In what ways does it appear as, as a public as a social issue from seven, 1970 to the present in order um, before I, I'm adding those other layers? And one of the first major surveys into domestic violence was conducted in 1988 by the Office of Status of Women on Border Community Attitudes to Domestic Violence. And these were released to coincide with International Women's Day. And at that point, it was the largest survey to date, so 1,500 uh, people. 
And the responses revealed what was widely reported as a high rate of acceptance of DV among both men and women. So for example, 22% of men and 17% of women were found to believe a man was justified in shoving, kicking or hitting his wife if she did not obey him, refused to have sex with him, wasted money, had sex with another man or failed to keep the house clean. So of course, one of the challenges with, this, with these kinds of surveys about attitudes is to how do we shore it up against other sorts of evidence, such as say, for instance, judicial responses to domestic violence. Um, and at the moment in, in the research that I've begun on the 1990s, um, the attitudes of judges um, becomes an alarming issue in the 1990s. There are some, some very high profile judgments, including um, um, and, and findings, including surveys into judges. One judge who was anonymous at the time initially said that he thought that nagging was, was a, a, a justifiable reason for domestic violence. And there's been a huge, there has been a shift in judicial responses, but that, that, that attitude was kind of observable in the 1990s was the thing that we found quite surprising. Okay, so just to end with a general point, I mean, one of the assumptions about doing a history of domestic violence was that, that it's going to be really hard to find the evidence. We have had no trouble having to find finding the evidence, but at the same time, we must acknowledge historical silence. What you know, we, we must acknowledge that, that, that this is always bound to be a project in some sense of a failure to account for the true extent. We will never know the true extent of domestic violence. One pattern that we see is domestic violence is perpetually being discovered and rediscovered. And at any one given time, it is both tolerated and condemned. Uh, DV must be understood, as I mentioned, in relation to violence and gender relations more generally. Um, and, and that link between, you know, the, do the more equal that the gender relations become, does domestic violence reduce is, is, is an interesting one. As a public private problem, however, first hand accounts must be foreground wherever possible, while highlighting what possibilities or constraints exist, what makes it possible to people to share their first hand experiences, and what obstacles stand in the way and continue to stand in the way. So that's where I will stop today. Thank you. Thank you, Zora. And um... We've got time just for a, a question or two, um, but I'll encourage everyone to pop any questions you have in the Q&A. If we don't have time for it now, we'll try to get to it at the end. And a reminder that if you want to, you can ask questions anonymously. Um, so there's a question here already for you, Zora, asking, um, though, you, though your research is so focused on Australia, can you tell us how domestic violence in Australia compares with other countries? Um, very good question. Um, I can, I can, well, where do I start with this? I should, I should know this because I, I, I recently looked up where Australia sits in the OECD in terms of um, global incidence of domestic violence. It's actually quite high in terms of comparable societies. Um, New Zealand is, 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 is the worst, apparently mm. one of the worst, and Australia is quite behind. Um, I can say one way that domestic violence has been discussed throughout this history is uh, often in relation to Britain. Um, and particularly in the in the colonial in the colonial period, um, the most obvious comparators are say the US uh, and and Britain and New Zealand, which are having kind of similar patterns of you know feminist activism responses to and so on. And the statistics there are all remarkably consistent, although higher in certain groups than others. Mm -hmm. um, although whether this idea of a national disgrace that we're working with today. Um, asks of us to think about, is there anything specific about the conditions in Australia that produce domestic violence? Mm. Um, and some sort of analyses over this period suggest that Australia is more prone to a particular, at certain times because of the demography of Australian population, more men um, at certain times mm. and so on. That's mm -hmm. a good question. Yeah. And are there any similar projects to yours with, with Anne and Catherine happening elsewhere in the world? Yeah, there, there are. Um, there's been some really good ones come out in the last few years. One in particular I'm thinking of is in Ireland, um, which uh, has an alarming <laughs> history of, of in, in that in that history. And every, every, I mean, of all these kinds of histories, you'll always see common themes across all of them. 
Uh, the US was the first to kind of attempt to kind of national histories of, of domestic violence. You'll see common patterns, but also um, spe specificities. And in that Irish case, it's the role of the church and, mm -hmm. and how that has prevented some people from, from coming forth um, and how that the, the institution of marriage um, has really affected domestic violence rates mm -hmm. and responses as well. Thank you, Zora. I'm going to invite Margie back in to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, um, Zora and Alicia. Fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, so many issues. Our next speaker is Professor Lisa Featherstone. Lisa is Head of School in the School of Historical and Philosophical Inquiry at the University of Queensland. Her research considers the ways in which historical attitudes inform attitudes towards sexual assault, both past and present, and she is the author of many publications in and around that area. She has two major research projects on the go at the moment, and she will speak um, on a topic which comes from one of them, and her, her talk is entitled Sexual Assault at Trial, the Law and Lived Experience. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much and thank you for having me today. I'd like to acknowledge that I stand on the land of the Yagara and Turrbal people on land that was never ceded. Uh, I acknowledge their custodianship of this land and their care for this beautiful country that I sit on and their continued cultural knowledge and education in this place of learning. As a historian, I'm really interested in the connections between the past and the present and um, how things shift and change and mutate over time. And I'm interested, I guess, in incremental change, those tiny movements that shape our daily lives. But I'm also interested in the big dramatic moments of reform and revolution. And I guess today I want to talk about the 1970s and 80s, which, in which we see both of those kinds of change uh, and both drive each other, big change and small change. This is a period of vast legal change around sexual violence. It's a change that was powerfully driven by second wave feminists and picked up by sympathetic journalists uh, and also by politicians uh, and public servants. In a, in a short period of time, Australian jurisdictions reformed sexual assault laws in very significant ways. And some states were slower than others. Of course, I'm here in Queensland uh, where things moved more slowly. Um, but I think across the board, this period shows significant change, including the decriminalisation of consenting homosexual offences. Marital rape was newly criminalised, and um, the decade saw some nascent attempts uh, across the 1980s to criminalise intimate partner violence. Sexual crimes, including rape, were redefined to include other forms of sexual penetration, and feminists drove the inclusion of significant protections for uh, victims and survivors at trial. Oops, sorry. Did that just move the PowerPoint? Sorry, hope that's working. Yes, it did. It's all good. Yeah, sorry, I hope it's working. Uh, I can't see it fully on my screen. Uh, we see, a sh uh, so we, in theory, women could no longer be harassed on trial in the way that they had been in the lead up to these reforms. Uh, with many components saying that they saw the trial as, as traumatic as the sexual assault itself. So there's a great deal of change and it's accompanied by and is driven by, I think, a degree of cultural change. We see a reshaping of public attitudes towards gender violence, uh, influenced by feminists, but also trickling down into the mainstream. That said, ideas about sexual violence continued to be heavily mediated by Australian ideals of masculinity, by policing practices, by the problematic, uh, problematics of the castle or state, and by media reporting, and uh, you know, picking up on many of those issues that Zora's just spoken about. It's both a period of courageous change and also, I think, the consolidation of traditional ideas about masculinity, femininity, and sex. Yet as I want to show today, despite the significant legal reform that occurred in this time period, sexual offences remained difficult to prosecute, especially when the victim was an adult woman. Uh, and female victims continued to be victimised on the stand and issues of consent and bodily autonomy were very much clouded. 
And of course, as Zora has well shown, marginalised groups were even less supported than other groups. First Nations people continue to be sexually assaulted at higher rates than non-Indigenous women. And there were very few safe resources for Indigenous people to seek assistance. LGBTIQ groups were also underrepresented in discussions about gender violence and sexual violence. Uh, and though we know that queer people were suffering violence more regularly than uh, other groups. So this paper today draws on transcripts of criminal trials in New South Wales uh, from 1980 and 1985. So that's just before and just after uh, law reform in, uh, in New South Wales. It will explore the interactions between social change legal reform and the courtroom machinations. I'm going to draw largely on three cases, but um, and ones before law reform and two after, but I've read hundreds and hundreds of these cases uh, more broadly in this time period. And I want to highlight that even in the midst of a revolution in attitudes towards violence, hopes for change within the Australian court system were never quite fulfilled. At the same time, I have a moment of optimism. Um, I argue that we begin to see nascent change by women themselves in how they understand gendered violence, including how victims themselves articulated the, the assaults that were done against them. So as I've noted, one of the chief problems for women at trial was the way that victim survivors were subject to extraordinary scrutiny, all of which was quite acceptable in the adversarial court system. And the complainant was subject to continued investigations into her perceived morality, her dress, her habits, um, particularly whether she'd been smoking, drinking or taking drugs, and of course her sexual experience. And I want to give one example from 1980 which shows the ability of defence lawyers to harass and smear female complainants while they're under cross-examination. So this is the trial from 1980 and two brothers have been charged with offences against the 18-year-old woman. Uh, both men were charged with rape and assault occasion and actual bodily harm. On the stand, the complainant, Gay Jacobs, gave evidence that the men, one of whom she'd known for 18 months, had promised her a lift home and he'd taken her to a deserted area. She alleged that the two men raped and physically assaulted her before dumping her naked on the side of an isolated road. During cross-examination, the defense hinted that Gay Jacobs was an immoral or loose woman. She'd been drinking at an RSL club and she left late. She hitched, hitchhiked home. Defence also raised her use of alcohol. She claimed that she'd shared three bottles of wine with her foster brother during the uh, evening before the assault took place. And so here defence is kind of arguing for her irresponsibility. And finally, defence questioned her morality, as you can see from the slide, the series of questions about her previous sexual ex experiences and how she might have um, associated with men in the past. And it, it finishes with the defense. You see, I suggest to you that what happened was that the defendant asked you to have intercourse with him and you said that you would. And she answers very briefly, no. At no point during this interrogation from the screen could the prosecutor object. Her, in 1980, her sexual past was fair game on the stand. Despite the tangible changes to ideas of sexual morality, which had occurred over the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the social and sexual revolutions, the young woman was still held to an almost Victorian standard of morality. She's um, constructed as sexually promiscuous um, and problematic in multiple ways. And I, I suspect, though I can't tell, um, the court records we have are very flat documents. We don't get much of a sense of the women themselves, but I suggest that this defence strategy was probably backed up by her bodily presence uh, in the courtroom. She's an unemployed working class woman from a very low socioeconomic area in New South Wales. Her presence was likely a striking contrast against the highly educated, mannered lawyers in the courtroom. The defence then continued with a line of questioning that suggested that Gay Jacobs agreed to sex before she was threatened with physical violence. She had given testimony that the worst of the sexual assault, uh, the worst of the physical abuse had occurred after the sexual assault, so that they had sex with her and then uh, physically assaulted her. But she also showed that prior to the rape, one of the offenders had grabbed her by the throat and used that to force her back into the car. Defence suggested that this was not threatening, while the victim insisted that she knew exactly what the men were saying would happen to her. 
Uh, she said in her own words that they would, in her words, punch her up. So here, her intuition and her local knowledge, which is soon, we might note, to be confirmed by her lived bodily experience of being beaten by the men, was juxtaposed against the careful and clinical legal reasonings of the defence lawyer. The complainant was effectively put on trial for both her actions on the night, but also her sexual past. Her perceived morality was read in the courtroom through the prism of both gender and class. After law reform in New South Wales, it was more difficult to ask questions about an alleged victim's morality. By the mid-1980s, overt victimisation on the stand was perhaps less common than it had been in earlier decades. Yet recent empirical studies by historians and uh, criminologists, including work by Angie Kalajelfus, has showed that while this harassment on the stand ostensibly changed over time, female victims were still subject to intrusive questioning well after the initial law reform. And I guess the, the answer here is that defence lawyers simply found new ways to ask old questions. So while in theory the law offered some new protections, and it did, uh, many of the old problems of evidence, testimony and questioning persist. And in particular, the issue of consent and proving lack of consent remained. So as we know, defining and articulating and proving consent was and is one of the most troubling aspects of sexual assault. A woman's consent in the late 20th century interpretation might be understood as occurring verbally or via her actions. Consent did not have to be given verbally, but rather could be read through body language. And what this meant in practice was that there was a considerable legal opening to argue that a man had thought that the woman had agreed to sex. For instance, in another trial in the Supreme Court, Justice Fisher asked the jury to consider the following as signs whether or not a woman had consented. Why was she in the car with women? Did she cry or scream? Had she taken off her own clothes willingly? Did she need to be threatened? Was she held down? Did it seem logical that she might have sex with numerous strange men in a row? Did, it, did any of this make sense if she was a virgin or if she was a more experienced woman as, they, as the terminology uh, was? Intriguingly to me, it was the, the women complainants themselves who showed a significant shift in thinking about consent. In mid-century court transcripts, female, so in the 1950s, uh, complainants were largely docile. They were led in the 1950s very much by lawyers and legal process. But by the 1980s, adult women complainants often articulated very clear understandings of the concept of consent and openly resistant or defied defence attempts to label rape as consensual. The feminist reconceptualising of sexual violence had clearly impacted on women in mainstream Australia both before and after law reform. Take for, an, take for example, an exchange that took place in the courtroom in 1985. So that's after law reform in New South Wales, with a young woman complainant clearly articulating newer social and legal understandings of consent. Wendy Owen gave testimony that she had been in a car with three men while she was threatened with a gun. The men told her they were going to have sex with her. Frightened for her life, Wendy agreed. It was a pragmatic decision by a woman attempting some agency. So she had sex with the first two men and the third man then came into the car. She would later tell the court, I was so, I was very scared and, and terrified and numb and shocked. I just knew I had to, you know, keep my head together and, you know, get through the last one and just hope to God they took me home. The third man demanded oral sex and then anal sex and the young woman tried to negotiate with him to have uh, vaginal sex, but he threatened her again with a gun. And she would later give testimony that she had not consented to any of this sex with any of the men. And she's asked, did you consent to any of these sex uh, sexual activities? No, I did not. Then she's questioned, why were you involved in them? And she answers, simply because I was being held at gunpoint and I was frightened for my life and my physical well-being, and I was prepared to oblige them and cooperate with them as far as, you know, the sexual acts that they wanted from me in order to protect my life and my physical well-being. Due to the law reforms, the consent, the defence could not now openly argue that she was a loose woman for not being a virgin at the time of the assault. But what they did was shift tenure. The cross-examination by defence focused on her alleged consent, arguing 
that, they, that she had willingly got in the car with three men and traded sex for a lift home. Because why else would she be in the car? Unsurprisingly, the young men claimed that she had consented or at least that she had not objected. One of the accused even told the police, well, I asked her earlier in the night when she had said no, and he's on the record to say that she says no. But other than that, she didn't direct me. She didn't say to me, Rick, you can't have sex with me. The accused men argued that she had consented, but that she had done so after she had screamed, after she had been crying, and after she had been threatened with a gun. So despite legislative reform and despite the attempts of the legislation to uh, secure the legal meaning of consent, um, the law still required this to be played out in court. Um, there's an invitation to interpret these, these happenings in the courtroom. The very looseness of the meanings of consent effectively put the victim on trial. So what we see here in the 1970s and 80s is a period of substantial change but where change within the courtroom is slow and sometimes even elusive. Defence lawyers in particular found workarounds to highlight the victim's perceived lack of morality, her loose sexual past or her overt willingness to, con to consent. And they still continue to use things like questions about um, drinking and drugs and so on to, to show she was a certain kind of woman. Perhaps the most significant change, however, I think was that women, and they're often young women, themselves began to interpret the meanings of consent and to speak back to both the law and the courtroom. Though, as we've seen, the court remained a monolith that was largely slow and unresponsive to social and legislative change. It was the complainants, the women themselves, who showed signs of emerging proto-feminist responses. Much like today, we see attitudes towards gendered violence being driven by survivors who have had to attend not just to the assault itself, but to their subsequent trials in court and in the media. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, gosh, that really um, took us back to the 80s and, and one of our um, attendees is reflecting exactly what you were talking about there around um, being on a jury in the mid 80s um, and seeing what the defence lawyers were putting these women through um, in terms of um, saying why she was there and, and in this case um, saying she was a prostitute or essentially implying that in that. So I was wondering, um, while maybe some of our audience members um, put together a question, what are the, the challenges or the limitations of using court records? You mentioned they're a really flat document in terms of um, when you're interpreting and, and using them for your research. Can you talk about that? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of limitations with these. Mm. There's a lot of advantages because in some ways you get to, you get to hear a, a muted voice of the women themselves and you also sometimes get to get to, you sometimes get access to um, men who give testimony or, and so on. So there's, there's some amazing things that come out of these transcripts, but they depend, they, they really only represent certain groups of, of, of uh, offenders and victims. So we only see court transcripts appear when there's a trial. So all of the cases that don't go to trial, all of the cases that get thrown out by police, all of the cases that are never taken up in any way, um, the attrition, we don't see any of those cases and nor do we see the cases where women just don't report to start with. So I would say we do not, we see what is really the tip of the iceberg, which are cases where someone thinks that prosecution is possible and we don't get to see the vast majority of cases where, um, you know, it's a he said, she said, or where there's no other extenuating circumstances. And it also skews very much to certain groups. So there's, um, you know, I have very few court cases that involve um, Indigenous women. Um, we do have some with Indigenous offenders. But again, they're, they're, they're a very skewed kind of demographic. Mm -hmm. And do you find yourself drawn to sort of try to expand your understanding of that particular case? Do you do other work or is that just impossible in the volume that you're looking at? Um, I try to narrow down to some cases because you, you just can't deal with every court case in uh, you know, a great deal of detail, but we, um, 
Angie and I wrote on the 50s together and then this later work um, I write on my own. But we, we you know, use things like Trove and newspaper reports and other kinds of things to fill in the gaps. But also I, I have looked more broadly at a lot of um, uh, feminist material around sexual offending in this time period and other kinds of uh, things beyond the court because, as I said, the, the court records only represent a very tiny amount of sexual assaults that occurred in this time period. I'm going to um, invite Margie back now. Um, thank you, Lisa, and we look forward to seeing you as we bring everyone together at the end. Thank you very much, um, both Lisa and Alicia. So many questions and such an interesting discussion. Thank you. And we have um, another very good question actually sitting in the Q&A for afterwards too. Now, our final speaker this evening is Dr. Alana Piper. Alana is lecturer at the Australian Centre for Public History at the University of Technology, Sydney. She's published widely on the history of crime and criminal justice in Australia, and she will speak to us tonight on her current research project on sex and the Australian military. Her paper is entitled Gender-Based Violence and the Australian Military, 1914 to 1945. Welcome, Alana. Thank you uh, for that introduction, Margie. Uh, so yes, um, firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, sovereignty of which was never ceded. I'd also like to begin by thanking my fellow panelists whose scholarship I always find you know, really truly inspiring. So I was very pleased to receive this invitation. And uh, finally, a big Thank you for the organisers of the event uh, to, for inviting me uh, to share some of my um, initial findings and, and work out some of my thoughts around this uh, ongoing project that uh, I'm working on, a century, century of sex in the Australian um, military with my co-investigators. And uh, tonight I'm going to be talking through mainly the sorts of uh, discourses in the early 20th century, although the project overall will uh, bring it up to today. And I do sort of mention comparisons between past and present in that regard in the presentation. So by 1920, newspapers, police and judges were all sounding alarm about violent criminal behaviour among returned servicemen left mentally scarred or desensitised to brutality by the First World War. One case that stimulated such fears occurred in October 1919, when four returned soldiers tried to enter brothels in Perth's Vice District during the early morning hours, shooting women at two establishments when they were refused entry. The jury strongly recommended mercy, but Justice Burnside was disinclined to provide such leniency. In lengthy sentencing remarks that were reported throughout Australia, Burnside wondered how Australian troops, who he noted had been considered models of chivalry towards women while serving overseas, could behave with such dishonour. Today I will chart some of the changing understandings of the relationship between gender violence and military service that influenced court and community attitudes in Australia across the early 20th century. Burnside's comments exemplify a period of shift from the First World War when gender violence was constructed as antithetical to the idealised model of Australian masculinity that the serviceman was thought to typify, to an interwar period where gender violence became seen as an understandable consequence of wartime trauma. The realities of the connection between military service and gender violence, though, were always more complicated, something that would start to gain recognition in World War II. And so my discussion today focuses on sexual violence, particularly a sample of 321 cases from Victoria involving former active and future military men prosecuted between 1914 and 1945. So during World War I, gender violence was constructed as something the enemy did. Frank Bongiorno noting the frequent circulation of narratives of German sexual violence among wartime propaganda. As Justice Burnside's comments intimate, Australia's military was constructed as defenders of women. This portrait was not always accurate, 
comparison can even be drawn between the soldiers shooting up of the Perth brothels and the Battle of the Wazir in 1915, in which Anzacs violently rioted in Egypt's vice district. However, while sexual misbehaviour, including sexual violence by Australian soldiers occurred across the various places they were stationed overseas, Peter Stanley observes this was seldom reported at home or even recorded in official documents, surviving mainly as mentions in diaries, memoirs and oral histories. The perception of gender violence as antithetical to the idealised masculinity of the soldier meant that during the war years, military status was seen as compounding the offences of enlisted men accused of sexual violence. When Patrick Lynch was prosecuted for the attempted rape of a 16-year-old in 1915, Justice Madden expressed his extreme surprise that Lynch had not only been admitted into the community of soldiers, but was a member of the military police, given that he had several uh, previous convictions for serious offences. When Lynch begged for leniency so he might serve on the front, Madden responded derisively, the front? There are men at the front you will go to the back as far as you can ever be put, sentencing Lich to four years and a flogging. The following year, Michael Cook was tried for raping an 18 year old in Melbourne's public gardens after ingratiating himself with her by discussing military matters. The Crown prosecutor drew special attention to this behavior, asking whether Cook knew her father was at the front and whether he thought it was a shameful thing to destroy the virtue of a fellow soldier's daughter. Justice Hodges also cross-examined Cook severely about wearing the King's uniform during events, stating at one point that even if the girl had been a consenting party, his behaviour was without honour. Cook was sentenced to death, later commuted to seven years imprisonment due in part to his military service. Interestingly, during the rape, Cook justified his actions by claiming his sisters had been dishonoured while he was away on service, so he had now vowed revenge by dishonouring other men's sisters. As Joanna Burke observes, the idea of sexual violence against women as a way of communicating contempt to other men is one strongly associated with wartime sexual violence. It is also an idea that reappears in a 1917 case in which 20-year-old Roy Dundon was prosecuted for trying to blackmail a woman for sex by threatening to tell her father she was sexually promiscuous. The woman informed her brother, a recently returned soldier, who confronted Dundon, incensed not only by the insult to his sister, but that Dundon, a civilian, was wearing articles of military uniform. When Dundon was convicted, he promised it to enlist if given leniency, but was nevertheless, like Lynch, imprisoned. So this case demonstrates that although sexual violence was constructed in opposition to militarised masculinity, they were connected in that both sex and service at, during this period represented ways for men to prove their masculinity. And this links to Elizabeth Nelson's work on domestic violence. Nelson argues that in the interwar period, wife beating was often attributed to men's wartime trauma, but that it was actually the expectations of masculinity that the war produced that had the most impact on interwar domestic violence, an argument I think also applies to sexual violence. So there's been little work to confirm whether there was any factual basis to interwar anxieties about soldiers' mental trauma increasing sexual violence. In England, where similar concerns were expressed, Clive Elmsley points out that reported rates actually fell over the early 20th century. In Australia, prosecution project data does suggest a slight rise in prosecutions for interpersonal offences, including sex offences during the 1920s. And to date, no study has analysed whether servicemen were overrepresented in interwar courtrooms, but my Victorian sample suggests they were not, although admittedly there are limitations in the information available for linking trial and military records that mean not all men uh, who served in the military could be positively identified. However, as Nelson argues, the significance of soldier defendants cannot be judged simply on whether they inflated prosecution statistics, but how their presence in courtrooms influenced attitudes and responses to gender violence more generally. 
Analyzing veteran defendants accused of various crimes, Ali Lachlan asserts that the former servicemen typically received lenient treatment in Australian courtrooms as a result of two discourses. One that posited the soldier as an uber citizen whose war service suggested their crime was an out of character act, and another in which presumed mental trauma lessened their criminal responsibility. Examples of both discourses are evident in the cases I examined. There are even intimations in some that military service may have contributed to the dark figure of unknown crime by influencing whether victims reported assaults to police and where the police proceeded with charges. However, there were limitations to the extent to which military service mitigated perceptions of offenders' blameworthiness. War-induced mental disturbance was mostly raised as an excuse for sexual violence in cases where the perceived abnormality of the act itself made authorities more willing to believe it was the product of a diseased mind, such as in cases of familial sexual violence. Judges appear to have been less forgiving than juries in evaluating the crimes of returned servicemen, some of them expressing surprise at juries' recommendations to mercy or refusing to take them into consideration in sentencing. In one such case, the judges ordered flogging of a returned soldier convicted of attempted rape in 1919 produced community outrage with one letter to a newspaper signed an old soldier suggesting that the judge's failure to heed the jury's advice contravened the democratic principles Australians had fought for in the war. However, returned servicemen also benefited from existing gendered discourses that surrounded sexual violence trials in general. Most cases came down to a contest between perceptions of the victor's character versus the defendants, with war service enhancing the latter's credibility. Furthermore, rather than soldiers being responsible for the interwar increase in sex offences, it seems possible that this was an impact of the hypermasculine culture stimulated by the war. A highly suggestive case in this regard is a 1932 trial in which the defendant was the son of a soldier killed at Gallipoli and the alleged rape took place just outside the Shrine of Remembrance. The defendant was ultimately acquitted, himself going on to enlist in World War II, but the case does intimate how growing up in the shadow of war may have shaped attitudes to violence. As Joanna Burke points out, military sexual violence is likely as much a product of the military attracting violent individuals as it is of war stimulating violence where it didn't previously exist. That many men took existing tendencies to gender violence into the military is evident from the data, as around 12% of sexual violence prosecutions in Victoria during the interwar period involved future enlistees. The possibility that military cultures themselves might invite or breed sexual violence started to be recognised during World War II. This is due in part to the greater role of psychiatry in criminal trial processes, something Lisa has documented. Medical officers compiled detailed life histories about child sex offenders in particular, sometimes linking such abuses to sexual inclinations developed during military service. The abuse of a 10-year-old uh, uh, boy in 1944 was thus attributed to the defendant's experiences in the Navy, while an indecent assault of an eight-year-old girl that same year was ascribed to the defendant having become acquainted with various sex perversions while visiting French brothels during the previous war. Some women likewise complained during divorce hearings that their husbands had developed troubling sexual tendencies following military service. One woman declared that her husband had shown an abnormal sexual appetite following enlistment, allegedly forcing sex on her in 1942 when she refused intercourse and, perhaps influenced by the military's pin-up cultures, gifting her a fox fur and demanding that she pose for him in it naked, a request that horrified her. Another woman asserted that her husband had become both physically and sexually violent after returning from military service in 1942. She was inspired to leave him following a final violent rape during which he told her that he planned to use her for the same purpose whenever he wanted to and as often as he wanted to. This attitude of sexual entitlement was perhaps encouraged during the war by a more general discourse in which Australian women were represented as owing a sexual duty to enlisted men for their service. 
This discourse was evident in several cases where recently enlisted men attempted to cajole women into sex in view of their impending departures and then resorted to violence when such persuasions did not succeed. As women started to enlist during World War II, this drew attention to sexual violence within the military itself. The rape of a female Air Force member in 1942 demonstrates how the expectation that Australian women owed a romantic duty to men in service could be manipulated. The victim initially ignored the soldier who tried to engage her in conversation, but relented when he complained that Australian girls were too busy going out with the Americans to speak to the returned man. He then pretended knowledge of her brother as a pretext to have her meet him on base that night where he raped her. Another brutal rape case of a woman officer by a fellow soldier in 1945 foreshadowed what would become a trend in later cases of military sexual violence in which drink was used to render the victim less capable of struggling and then employed by the defendant at trial as a mitigating circumstance for their actions. That the military was not always invested in protecting its women recruits is evident from a 1944 case in which a 53 year old soldier attached to the ladies officers training school was charged with carnal knowledge of a 15 year old girl unconnected to the school. Despite the crime having been a violent one, the soldier's commanding officers spoke on his behalf, even saying he could continue his role at the school if the court granted him leniency. Justice Martin, however, showed more anxiety about the case than the army did, concluding that he needed to make an example of the defendant in order to protect girls in other Australian homes where soldiers were stationed. While the focus of today's event is violence against women, it was not only women who are at risk of sexual violence in the military or are at risk of it today. Boys who enlisted while underage were particularly vulnerable to sexual abuse. In 1942, three men were prosecuted for buggery of a 16-year-old enlistee stationed with them in the Watsonia military compound. The men's defence was that the victim was known around camp as always eager to let any soldier interfere with him, even though, as the judge pointed out, consent was no defence to the charges they were facing. Moreover, another soldier who witnessed events but had been too afraid to intervene corroborated the victim's statement that the encounter had been violent and non-consensual. Nevertheless, the jury issued a strong recommendation to Mercy on the grounds of the encouragement given to them by the young person. The military was ultimately a reflection, perhaps amplification, of gender cultures that existed in Australian society more generally. This can be seen in a 1940 case where the Crown prosecutor decided to drop the charges against a young man who had been the ringleader of a group of adolescent boys who routinely bullied another boy at the factory where they worked, culminating in committing an indecent assault against him. The Crown prosecutor dismissed the incident as one of indecent skylarking, noting that the defendant's recent enlistment would likely see him make good. It is possible that instead it would have seen him continue such behaviours as sexualised abuse became a frequent aspect of military hazing cultures. While the relationship between gender violence and military service was thus often discussed in terms of the impacts of wartime mental trauma, a trend and a discourse that continues today, it is clear that the relationship between military cultures and cultures of gender violence was more complex than this, uh, with military cultures acting as potential producers of such gender violence and something that started to be recognised by this World War II and that we are still grappling with today. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. I really uh, appreciated how um, your talk really brought us back into those early, those years in the early or the first half of the 20th century, bringing us into the stories that Zora and Lisa have shared with us as well. So I'm having a look at our questions that have come in from the audience. And I think um, whilst people, again, are sort of thinking of um, what they might what they might talk about. 
I wondered if you could talk about the, the records that you're looking at, Alana. I noticed a lot of newspaper articles, et cetera, but I, I'm fascinated to understand um, what you're looking at to um, mm. draw on for your research. Yeah, I'm really, I'm drawing on a, a range of sources. I mentioned in particular that I'm working with a sort of sample of court cases, mm. 321, where I was able to, um, you know, use data linkage to map um, prison records and, and military uh, records and, um, you know, sometimes where prison records don't exist, you know, drawing on sort of uh, newspaper reports to try and do that data linkage. But, uh, you know, as I, I mentioned, it's sort of an imperfect process because unfortunately, you know, as, as Lisa sort of mentioned with limitations of the trial briefs, um, you know, if, if a case didn't result in a conviction in a prison record, it's sometimes hard to judge from the trial brief itself whether, you know, someone of a particular name is a person of the same name, you yes. know, who has a military service record, you know, if it's a, a fairly common um, name and the trial brief doesn't sort of typically give details such as, you know, age of the offender or, you know, other uh, sort of demographic factors that you might use to sort of cross-validate. It's sort of reliant on, um, you know, newspaper reporting, um, prison records or, you know, occasionally um, police character reports if those are included there and mention the military service, um, but they didn't always. So, yes. Uh, yes, you know, I think it's sort of an under-representation, but that's the sort of, you know, uh, core of what I was uh, looking at for this 1914 mm. to 1945 period. Um, but beyond that, yes, you know, newspaper reporting and in terms of understanding, you know, cultures of... Uh, sex and, and sexual violence in the military more generally, um, you know, working with lots of memoirs, um, looking at sort of you know, existing oral history projects that have been done, um, you know, going back, uh, diaries, letters, correspondence, um, you know, it's, it's amazing um, the sort of wealth of material, which, you know, Zora, as Zora said, um, going into the project, sort of thinking that this would be hard to sort of ferret mm. out, but actually... Uh, you know, in terms of um, there being various sources available, it's it's the opposite problem. There's lots of places to wow. look for discussions. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking too um, of those military records, depending mm. on which sort of branch um, those servicemen were in also, you can get um, much more in-depth records that, um, you know, might give you more insight. Particularly I'm thinking of the Air Force records are often... Um, tend to have a bit more in them too. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, sort of military records and, um, you know, also looking into, you know, apart from sort of service records, you know, other sorts of documents that were produced by the military in terms of, you know, court-martial data, um, you know, inquiries that were held. So, yes, yeah. there's a lot to sort of read through and a lot to cover that I wasn't able to get into. Absolutely. And I can only imagine the volume, the volume of, of, that you're working with. Um, we've had a few more questions come in and I might ask you to um, just unshare your um, presentation as maybe we invite Zora and Lisa to share up, share with us first. Um, but there's a question for you, Alana, um, from Georgina saying, are you using courts martial records for assaults while the soldier is still in the army or, or where, where they might be? Uh, no, so, you know, there's uh, restrictions on, um, you know, up to when um, data is available and also, um, you know, I'm not personally doing oral histories, but um, with the oral histories that some of my co-investigators are doing, we're, you know, prevented from uh, interviewing people who are still uh, actively in the service at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's um, let's go get into some of these more general questions that have come through. Um, and Rachel asks Zora and all of you, um, can you reflect about the role of shame in decisions to either expose or silence experience of domestic violence and how that might have changed over time? And they're particularly thinking of Deborah Cohen's work on families and shame in the UK context. Would you like to take that first, Zora, if you can? Um, an excellent question. I mean, I, I think that this, what we found so far is that when, when I was talking earlier about how there's so much evidence about violence in the home and domestic violence, but at the same time, we always have to assume that there is 
there's equal amount of silence around it. I think shame is a huge feature there and we can see it particularly once people you start in you know in, in the period that I'm looking at 1970s to the present oral histories you know just people talking about their experiences in in various forms including in the courts shame just appears over and over again in in, in a variety of ways not just personal shame um you know never thought that they would see themselves in those circumstances Inter, intergenerational shame um it's just um the, the th thinking about yeah sorry <laughs> I feel so incoherent today because of my COVID brain um but that I, I think that is certainly um you know one reason why we see this 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 it, it's a huge feature of the, of the discussion of domestic violence as something that is still hidden behind closed doors but that that shame is multi-layered it's not just not wanting to dis to disclose but it's seen as both a personal failure, the sh the bringing shame to others around them, um, you know, sh shame that they didn't do enough, retrospective shame, shame in the moment. I mean, it's I haven't actually read Deborah Cohen's work, so I'm going to follow that reference up. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. What about you, Lisa? Do you have a... Um, I, I, they, um, the court records don't really talk to issues of shame. Um, so it's a bit hard for me to say, though I've read about it more broadly, of course. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't, because the court is very driven by the questions that lawyers are asking, those kind of issues don't really come up for me quite so much. Um, but I think you do get a sense of that when women clearly feel bad about themselves or, uh, but they're coached by their own lawyers not to do that. So it's mm. a for me to kind of comment too much yeah and what about you Alana yeah I think uh shame comes through in a couple of ways in the context of uh, the sort of um sexual violence in the Australian military uh one in terms of yes potentially contributing to like the dark figure of unreported cases or, or cases that aren't um proceeded with like there was um a case where a father was reluctant to report an indecent assault on his uh, child because the offender was in service and the father had been in service and uh, you know he, he delayed for sort of several days because he wrestled with this and was concerned about um, the you know impact that that would have on the army reputation during a period of wartime so you know I think um, you know, shame could sort of inhibit reporting of cases potentially and more generally for women victims in particular, you know, inhibiting that because you can see, as Lisa discussed in the cases that did go through and particularly in that sort of Second World War period where there's, you know, a huge moral panic around female um, sexuality, you know, women being very much shamed in the courtrooms in terms of the types of, yeah, cross-examinations and, you know, isn't it well known that you um, go around with soldiers or you would have talked to Americans in the past mm -hmm. you know that was the ultimate sort of damning thing during the second world war if you were known to uh, talk to Americans um, but yeah those sorts of shaming techniques yeah. and I was struck by the books that you shared with us in your presentation Zora around um, you know and you talked about the buddy effect and I it just sort of strikes me that um that explosion of, of first person narratives but then that real burden on these women who are absolutely exposing their their private um, matters to make to bring us perhaps to this moment of national visibility you're on mute Zora yeah absolutely and having to hold that space for others and all the story yeah. yes as well yeah, yeah they come to them and yeah, I think that's one of the really important things that this kind of work needs to do is to make sure that it's not only survivors who are speaking out and doing that hard work because, mm. um, you know, it's an enormous burden on them. And, you know, many, many women are happy to do that, but, but I think it can't only be survivors who speak to these issues. Mm. And even in Batty's book, she talks, you know, like she knew that the reckoning was going to come personally for her. She just knew it hadn't come yet, I felt. Um, yeah. We've got a question here from Zoe Smith, and that's about marital rape. 
And so drawing a little bit on what Zora said to us, um, that survey from 1988 where people said that a man was justified in kicking or hitting his wife if she refused to have sex with him and some of Lisa's pr previous work on marital rape in the history of domestic violence in Australia, is there a particular turning point when marital rape begins to be recognised as an explicit form of domestic violence linked to other forms of abuse, such as physical, economic, et cetera? Or was it always generally thought of as, as separate or more or less, less serious form of, of violence? Really? <laughs> oh, great question, Zoe. Um, and it's actually something that I've just started to do the research for a paper on to actually look at the links between sexual violence and rape in marriage and domestic violence. Um, I mean, it depends where you look. I don't think you can say there's one tipping point. I think it, it lags. Um, it, it, in, some, in some senses, rape in marriage falls between rape myths and domestic violence myths and re responses to legislation to do with rape and legislation to do with domestic violence. So it kind of sits in this in this awkward spot I mean if you look at you know in, in the 1980s Jocelyn Scott and her kind of work was trying to get um, rape in marriage recognized as a major feature of domestic violence and family violence and she certainly had a lot of people talking about it with her um, but you also see the same sorts of judicial problems that that, that Lisa has has sort of catalogued um, but uh, in, in any definition now that you look at of domestic violence in very any jurisdiction they'll have sexual violence in there um but sometimes if you shore that up against surveys including the one that was just released this week sexual violence isn't always identified as a common feature of domestic violence or a recognizable feature of domestic violence it's really um it's such a contradictory map and it's so it's hard to identify a specific turning point and, and, and again that assumption that rape is something that's committed by strangers um, and outside the home you see that reflected in how it's dealt with in relation to domestic violence so I think it's I think it's an ongoing thing um, yeah so. yeah I would really agree with that that this is not a conundrum we've yet solved actually uh, you know it's still hard to prosecute into intimate partner violence uh, I mean it's hard to prosecute any sexual violence but it is hard to prosecute intimate partner violence I think over the years that I've worked in this probably the one thing that shocked me more than maybe anything was how hard people fought against the criminalization of marital rape in the 1980s so this mm. is very recent past sometimes still politicians who are now politicians now you know arguing that this should not be a crime that this was something that, you know, women, ex um, you know, took on the role of sexual partner to their husbands when they got married, and that should be e forevermore. And I, I think um, while there was legis legislative change, and there's been cultural change, I don't think any politician would now come out and say marital rape shouldn't be uh, criminalised. I don't think anyone would say that, whereas lots of people were saying that in the, the late 70s and into the well into the 80s. Um, you know, it still remains a difficult thing to prosecute. And does that tap into, Alana, you were talking about that sense of duty that the women have, you know, um, in particular in regards to military men? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I did come across instances of marital raping, um, you know, some of the divorce cases that were going through that, um, you know, involved sort of returned soldiers, as I um, mentioned in the presentation so you know although it, it wasn't a crime I think women themselves you know still understood it as a traumatic you know experience in in those terms and um you know well before the sort of war going back to the 1850s and you know Lisa would know uh, about that you know far more than me um having having worked on that but uh yes you know I, I think it's not that uh, marital rape didn't exist or, you know, wasn't understood and recognised and, and can be found, you know, in, in um, various sorts of traces in the archives around, um, you know, particularly sort of separations and divorces. Mm. We've got a question here from Natalie and um, who's asking about research on domestic violence against women with disability and higher rates of violence perhaps experienced by these women that is both gender and disability specific. Would anyone like to respond to that question? I, I can, other than to say, um, um, as I mentioned earlier in my paper, this is just an area of research that is only in the last 10 years, I'd say, becoming more and more prevalent. 
um, and uh, it, it, it's like, you know we, it will definitely feature in our history at the point in which that becomes recognised. But we have found case, historical cases where disability, or what or, or, or we now recognise as disability, uh, appears as part of the domestic violence case, but is obviously is not understood as a variable at that time. Um, so I, I actually think it is something that deserves its own history in, in order to kind of make more sense of that. So um, th there's, there's so many things at play there, including recognising the specific um, uh, vulnerabilities of disability and at the same time in periods where our contemporary notions of disability didn't, didn't exist and when does that intersect with domestic violence. Mm. I haven't come across um, you know, cases of um, you know, women with disabilities in the cases that I've been looking at, but there were you know, several cases where return servicemen used their physical disabilities um, you know, as, as a pretext really to you know, get women and children alone in order to affect sexual violence, you know, which was quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. We've got a great question from, from Rachel over in New Zealand saying um, that women only became eligible to sit on juries in the 1940s and women were underrepresented on juries for many decades after that. And wondering, particularly to Lisa, have you looked at the gender composition of juries as a factor in sexual violence trials and how cases were argued by lawyers and the likelihood of getting a conviction? Yeah. Uh, it's actually later in New South Wales um, um, that that women could be on juries. So all of the work we did on the 1950s, there's no woman in the courtroom um, other than a secretary. So that's kind of quite extraordinary. Um, I think it does. Um, I, I think there's like a legislation in the late 1940s that allows women to go on the jury role, but it, it's not really uh, in a useful sense. Um, so that's in about 1947, I think. Um, but yeah, we don't see all, we, we in court trial transcripts that I that I use, um, we don't see who the jury is. Um, so we don't know. What is really interesting is some in the 1970s and 80s, you start to get um, some uh, second wave feminists going into courtrooms and recording really tricky sexual assault trials, and there you can sometimes get that kind of information. But uh, I think things like, uh, for example, one of the excuses to get out of um, being on jury duty was having children under the age of 16 and being the, the primary carer, you know, a housewife. Uh, those kind of things, even once women are allowed on juries, I think that they that, that jury presence tends to be quite low for quite a long period of time. Mm. We're um, getting close to the end of our time together and I can see whilst there are loads of wonderful questions, we're going to finish with this one from Daisy who says um, they're wondering if you could each speak to paths for future research in this area. So maybe Alana if you're happy to begin. Yeah, so um you know, I was attracted to this area of research, um, you know, apart from sort of, you know, ongoing projects that I have around understanding uh, crime within the context of life histories. And so, you know, the military service is a particular event um, within those life histories. And, you know, I think that there's incredible possibilities there with the work that is being done um, and, and also with sort of, you know, developing technologies in terms of, having a better understanding from history of pathways into domestic and sexual violence and the role that you know different big events um, and life experiences like military service can play in influencing those pathways. That sounds awesome, Alana. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got a pretty large project around consent, which uh, is an attempt to bring together people from across the University of Queensland to talk about consent in a very interdisciplinary space. So we've got two historians, um, myself and Cassandra Burns there, but also, we, you know, we're working with people from uh, everywhere from social work, psychology, um, um, social sciences and a raft of different places. So we're, we're trying to reimagine consent uh, in a kind of interdisciplinary space. 
uh, and we've got a book coming out later this year that's co-authored on that. Uh, and then I also have a broader project on, you know, imagining sexual violence um, um, in the late 20th century. So, yeah, there's still plenty of work to be done. I can think of many more gaps that we need to fill than what there is material now. So I'm excited um, to see how the research of the other people on the panel continues to go, you know, which looks amazing, and, uh, and other people working in the field. Both so right. There is still so much stuff to be done, and I, and I guess with this domestic violence project, when we began, I thought that there would be an end. But I think that once we've completed writing what we hope is a kind of overarching narrative that's useful for others to go, these are the major changes that happened, etc. With the focus on the most common form, men's violence against women, um, there is still so there is still so much other specific research that needs to be done. And I think a really important one is domestic violence in children. Um, you know, both as, you know, sort of victims of, um, you know, and how that affects their lives and so on. But there is, you know, we've already had important questions about disabilities. Same-sex relationships is one thing that, a kind of side project that I've been looking at, domestic violence, histories of domestic violence and same-sex relationships. So it's it's just endless. There is so much, you know, we see this actually reflected in the contemporary research on domestic violence, which is incredibly diverse um, some of the best in the world, I would say, and all of that kind of begs for more historical treatment of those issues as well. Mm. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to invite Margie onto the screen now um, for her concluding remarks, um, but I really appreciate both the questions that have come in from our audience and, and your time and thoughtfulness in responding to them. Thanks, Alicia. And special thanks to uh, our three wonderful speakers because they were just such terrific presentations. Zora Simic, Lisa Featherstone and Alana Piper, thank you so much for sharing that research and for generating so much interest. And we can see that in all the questions and some of which are still there. Uh, thanks too to our colleague behind the scenes, Al Thompson, who manages all the webinars so seamlessly. Uh, now I'm sharing again here. We'll see if it works this time. Special thanks to our sponsor, Monash University Publishing, which provides a gift to each of our speakers after their presentations tonight. And a brief plug to our next for our next seminar, which will be held at the same time on Thursday, the 18th of May, on the topic, the changing face of Melbourne's history, transforming our statues and memorials. So I do hope that some of you will be able to join us for that discussion. And finally, thank you so much to all of um, you for your attendance and participation tonight and for all the great questions. The recording of tonight's event will be available in a few days time when Alicia's had the chance to work through it all. And it will be on the History Council's YouTube site so you can access it there. So thank you everybody and good night. <laughs>